an honor to be here um, as the odd Belgian out um, amongst you all. Um, I had hoped and I urged uh, Pen and Salt, the publisher, to have the book ready by today, but unfortunately um, some practical things went wrong and the book will only be out, so I was told, in October. So I will be talking on the British West Indies Regiment, not on the West India Regiment, which also existed. So now, say something more about the difference between the two um, later on. Um, it, it's not a particularly easy subject to research because there are almost no texts known about the British West Indies Regiment. And so far um, only two, and if you include myself, only three scholars have really focused on the British West Indies Regiment. Um, one person, one historian in the Caribbean, Glenford Howe, who took a social uh, history approach uh, to the subject and then here in the UK Richard Smith who focused particularly on the Jamaicans within the British West Indies Regiment. Um, the reason why it's quite difficult to research, well, there's a number of reasons, um, for, well there's there are some memoirs but not a lot and they're dispersed. Uh, there are some letters, not a lot and dispersed. Um, according to me there's still a lot to be found in the islands, um, but um, I'm just a very poor historian and I don't have the funds to travel from island to island to do that research, so let's hope that if the interest is also raised over there that more things will pop up in um, the future. And also on the administrative side, um, if you look at the war diaries as they are kept in the National Archives, um, the war diaries of the different battalions of the West, uh, British West Indies Regiment are not as elaborate as some of the uh, British um, units. So uh, quite a difficult research, so you have to grasp the fragments you have and then try to make uh, something out. Um, still, it's an understudied, but still, according to me, an important subject, as Gary has already pointed out. Um, certainly during the centenary, we saw a tendency to a more inclusive remembrance. Um, it also points out to a rather underestimated aspect of the Western Front being labour and as the title of one uh, of the books states, uh, no labour, no battle. Um, and as the West Indies Regiment, mainly on the Western Front, was used as uh, labour behind the front line, um, obviously an understudied or the lines of communication for that matter. Um, and also you will see that throughout my talk uh, the undercurrent is the inherent racism with which the uh, West Indians uh, were uh, approached um, in the First World War. Um, and most importantly, I mean, this is a shared history and I always think this is very important and that's also something we've seen to the centenary. Um, very often, I mean, let's me give you another example. When I started working on the Indians in the First World War way back in 1999, the reason I did so was uh, a chance acquaintance with uh, a Sikh living in Holland. And I met him under the Menin Gate and I said, well, what brings you here? And he says, well, you see the names of the Sikhs? Um, this is the only place in the Low Countries where your history and my history meet. And I think that's a very important, and, and the same goes for the British West Indies Regiment um, and for the Western Front in general as a multicultural uh, battlefield avant la lettre. So we're talking about the British territories in the Caribbean. Um, Bermuda is generally not included in the West Indies and, and Bermuda had its own units and many Bermudans served in um, in, in regular uh, British units as well. Um, apart from two, um, we're talking about islands. So the two exceptions are uh, British Guyana and British Honduras, later to become Belize. Um, islands put with poor connections in between. Uh, poor connections between the islands, both poor connections between the islands and the mainland. Um, letters sent from one island to another often had to go first to Halifax and then return or even to London and then return, um, which means that even if, if there were some exchanges, we're not talking about a unity, we're not talking about one single polity. This, this is really a conglomerate of different um, colonies. But 
very much a settler society. With settler society, I mean there are hardly any natives. There are no or hardly any indigenous people. And that's very important to take, uh, to keep in mind because even the coloreds, the majority um, of the population in the West Indies, um, the colored population, they were also settlers. Even if they were also imported, even if they were imported as subaltans, as slaves, but still not originating from the islands, which means that their identity and how they identified was British, which is unlike, um, let's say, native Canadians or, um, or, uh, or, or, or Indians for that matter. So their main cultural framework was British. Very important to take, uh, keep in mind. And then the issue of color, uh, of skin color, was, which was extremely important and um, probably exaggerating a bit, but the darker you were, the lower you were on uh, society's ladder. Um, later on in, in history, the West Indies would be very briefly uh, federated, 1958, 1962. And as you know, um, there are still some common institutions. There's the University of the West Indies and, most importantly of all, cricket, of course. Um, these territories, all these colonies had a large, there was a large variation in level of self-government, um, but nearly all uh, were governed by an appointed council. And if there was a franchise, um, it was a very, very limited franchise, only the 2% uh, richest, for instance. Um, so, uh, very, yeah, pretty much a plantocracy, as it was uh, often called. And in um, the West Indies, the West India, and certainly if it concerns relationship with the UK, the West India Committee played an important role and will play an important role in um, the British West Indies Regiment as well. And the West India Committee, still existent, um, founded in the 18th century, uh, mainly by planters and um, proprietors uh, with grounds in, uh, in, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, quite a paternalist, um, and paternalist doesn't mean unsympathetic, but a paternalist uh, organization, um, exclusively white, um, who would take care during the First World War of the welfare and also the kitting out of the British West Indies Regiment, uh, but seldom without losing sight of their uh, own uh, benefits and um, their own advantages. Um, one of the things they, they would do, for instance, it's uh, what you will see on one of the next slides, is um, they are the ones choosing the batch for the British West Indies Regiment, which, and the batch will be a very important identifying um, item. Um, so often called a plantocracy or a pigmentocracy, uh, depending on your view. Um, and again, most importantly, what I want to stress, many, many cultural differences between the islands and the mainland territories, but at the same time, very British. Now, when war broke out in 1914, um, as everywhere in the British Empire, um, in the Caribbean, um, people will rally around the flag. Um, including many educated uh, colored people, and they are um, always refused, um, all, certainly initially. And I think this is a very telling photograph, and um, I deliberately included the caption, and the caption reads, Soldiers of the Barbados, Citizens Contingent. Now, what, what does this mean? That means that you only see white guys, so the white guys are citizens, the other ones are subjects, and they weren't allowed in the Barbados, Barbados citizen contingent. And um, so white recruits from the Caribbean would find their way into um, regular British units. You would find them in the King's Royal Rifle Corps and etc. Um, but black and colored subjects of uh, the empire were not allowed to join. And even if spontaneously, they would uh, come to the recruitment office. And this led to a protest by many educated, non-white, upper and middle class uh, people in the Caribbean. And from different territories, a petition was made to the government in London. And this led to a discussion between the war office, the colonial office, and uh, the local governors. Uh, but mainly 
the um, issue at stake was, uh, well, for the British Army, was what to do with recruits of African origin. Um, so this was a, quite a discussion, uh, late 1914, beginning of 1915. And ultimately, uh, the discussion was decided upon by King George V himself, who intervened in April 1915, and who said, who actually said to the War Office, well, I think there should be an opportunity for my um, uh, subjects of uh, African origin to join the army. And then it was decided to create the British West Indies Regiment, which came into being in October 1915. So recruitment starts in uh, early 1915. The British West Indies Regiment officially was established only in October 1915, which is the reason why quite often um, in 1915 there will be talked about the uh, West Indies contingent and not yet the regiment. The first recruits, let's say the first four or five battalions, um, were usually educated people, uh, middle and upper class. Uh, later on in the war, um, you also had uh, more people from the labor classes recruiting uh, because there was also a financial crisis in the Caribbean um, and mainly uh, Jamaicans who had worked on the Panama Canal because the Panama Canal was finished in 1914 so then these people were out of labor and um, the British West Indies, the establishment of the British West Indies Regiment uh, offered an opportunity to, uh, to have a proper wage. But there were also other reasons and especially amongst those uh, educated elements, um, you see that the wish to obtain more rights was also an incentive to uh, join um, the army. Um, so let's say to become from a subject, a proper citizen, to open up franchise, um, not yet at that stage home rule, but definitely a larger franchise. At the same time, you also had opponents of recruitment. Um, and we do have some quotes of a young man who joined up and his aunt reproached them and said, oh, this is a white man's war, uh, shouldn't join it. So. Now they got the batch of the British West Indies Regiment um, encapsulated by a British West India Contingent Committee which was part of that uh, West India uh, Committee I've uh, talked about um, previously. Um, they took care of the welfare um, of the West Indians who were sent to Europe and the Middle East. Um, but the batch, I consider the batch quite important because the batch was created, it was uh, really thought about. Uh, what you actually see is uh, quite neutral um, and still honorable ensign uh, with a caravel of Columbus, um, the crown on top. And the thing is that um, knowing the, the large diversity of territories the men were coming from, um, that this was a unifying thing wearing the same badge um, and, and, and much more important so than other badges perhaps. Again, do not confuse the British West Indies Regiment with the West India Regiment, which was a regiment which existed longer time, uh, who has been deployed in the First World War mainly in Africa, uh, who was on the Caribbean's own defense force and where the recruitment was also quite different, uh, generally considered uh, more people from the lower classes were drafted into uh, the West India regiments uh, on the country of, uh, contrary to the British West Indies regiment. But still, despite the fact that the British West Indies regiment was established, uh, by no means everyone within the British army was enthusiast. And I'll just give you one, uh, one quote. Major General Sir Charles Edward Caldwell, Director of Military Operations and Intelligence at the War Office, abhorred the idea that colored man could be handling hand grenades. And I quote him, in the hands of such natives, they would be a greater source of danger to their friends than the enemy, end of quote. And again, I just want to point out the mistake that is made again and again throughout the war. Um, the major general is talking of them as natives. They were not natives. Um, they were British, just like the white settlers in the Caribbean. So actually, basically what you see, it's okay to become a soldier 
for the colored Caribbean, but not to, fight, not to fight against whites. And so it was decided to deploy them initially, to deploy them in the Middle East, Egypt in the Middle East, and not in Europe. And that's something that you will see throughout the war. The only battalion of the British West Indies Regiment that has fought did so in the Middle East, not on the Western Front. On the Western Front, despite being trained infantry, they were deployed as navvies. Um, another remarkable thing is if you want to join the British West Indies Regiment, uh, you had to be able to read, which was not really a requirement um, in uh, Europe. Um, and, and with the museum I work for, we did a project on uh, illiterate Belgian soldiers. I can't tell you there were a lot of them. Uh, but if you joined the British West Indies Regiment, you had to be able to read and write. Um, and many were underaged, which is also a very remarkable fact. Um, Etienne Dupuge, whom I will quote several, several times, who's from the Bahamas, was 17 when he joined up. Um, the youngest uh, shot at down, Herbert Morris, was 17 uh, when he was shot. So many underaged, and I know at least two other headstones uh, in the Ypres salient of 17-year-old uh, Caribbean um, soldiers. Now, if you look at the composition and service, um, the first four battalions are trained infantry and really hoped to be used as such. But only the first infantry was actually uh, deployed in battle in uh, Palestine. Um, what I want to stress from this uh, overview is the importance, which has been underestimated uh, until now, of France and Flanders and thus of the Western Front. Because if you look at, for instance, the 3rd and the 4th Battalion, of whom we are uh, mostly informed, best informed, well, they went to Egypt, but then they arrived in Egypt, I think it was April or May, and two months later they were sent to the Western Front. So their passage in Egypt is just a very short passage and then so you've got one two three four five six seven out of the 12 battalions who served on the western front um, and some who never made it to the front because the two battalions the 11th and the 12th who um, served in Italy were serving in harbors and so on but not near to the front line um, the highest grades that could be obtained for non-whites was sergeant so all the officers uh, were white men quite often from the Caribbean, uh, but not always. I'll tell you something more about these uh, officers and the quality of the officers uh, later on. Um, well, another overview. Um, if you look at the, um, the strength of the British West Indies Regiment, we're talking of 15,000 people in total, a bit more, um, two thirds coming from Jamaica, 10% um, coming from Trinidad, uh, and then the other ones, 5% from um, Barbados, 5% from Guyana, and the other ones from all these islands. Um, Jamaica with the highest percentage, but it's still only 1% of the population. Um, which means that, well, they're all volunteers, but we're talking about a vanguard. Uh, these are really motivated people. Um, still, and certainly in some of the smaller islands, um, Leeward Islands, 0.18% of the population, well, that's... Um, so I won't hide this. Uh, 15,000 from the Caribbean, it's not unimportant, but it's not a mass uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Um, well, this has to do with the third contingent. Uh, the Daily Gleaner is still the most important uh, journal published in um, Jamaica. Uh, for the people from Kent, you can see this is a reference to the, the tragedy in, in Faversham. Um, but you see, what happened is uh, the third contingent sailed from Jamaica, um, and actually everybody, even from the other islands and from the mainland, first went to Jamaica, and then from Jamaica they went on, first to Halifax, and then from Halifax they were crossing across the Atlantic. They were traveling in tropical clothing and then caught in a snow blizzard, which was a complete tragedy, because despite the fact that they had warm uniforms at hand, but they were in the hold of the ship. They were never taken out. And what is the result? 200 seriously injured, nine dead. Um, first, they had to stop in Bermuda. Um, a telling quote, Eugene Clark, when he was interviewed, 
um, I think he was 101 then, in 1999, remembered, and I quote him, when we got to Bermuda, I was just creeping. I couldn't walk, just creep on my knees. Um, so this had a very major negative influence on recruitment for a while, because as you can see, it was quite widely uh, reported. When they arrive in Europe, um, they are first concentrated. Now we're back in uh, summer of 1915, September, October 1915. They are first concentrated in Seaford, um, halfway between Eastbourne and Brighton on the south coast. Um, and some remarkable things. Well, first of all, um, it was already notified that some of the officers were of rather poor quality, and I'll come back to that later on. But also that very soon after arrival, you had the first manifestation of agency, of activism. Uh, when the wages were arriving late, at one night, panels went up and there were minor strikes, but still strikes. Uh, panels were set up, no money, no work. Um, well, how was the reaction? Well, the instigators were sent home. Um, and when the instigators were sent home, and that's quite interesting, they also sent home the handful of Indians, East Indians from Trinidad, who had also joined up because they didn't want them to be part of the, the British West Indies uh, Regiment. Um, but at the same time, uh, despite these minor agitation, you also have these positive engagements. And for instance, what you see here, I, th I think this is quite a remarkable um, document. Um, it's part of a nurse's souvenir book from her time uh, in one of the hospitals on the south coast, and she asked several West Indian soldiers to write their IDs. Now, there's, there's some things that I want to point out, despite right, a nice poem, and in Dutch we call that caramel version, which means caramel verses, which means that it's not high poetry, but still. Um, I have come from the West to try and do my best. Um, I will show the Germans what zest the boys of the West possess, etc., etc., etc. But you can see this is a very neat, clear handwriting. Um, there's no mistakes against English. Um, and I think that was something that surprised many locals, both in England, but also, as you will see later in my talk, uh, in, uh, on the Western Front in um, Belgium. Now, from April 1916, as I told you, um, four battalions went to Alexandria, but only one battalion, the first battalion, would be allowed to fight. Symbolically very important, but still just one of the 12 battalions. Um, and already in August 1916, the third and the fourth went back, not, not back, were sent to France and Flanders. Um, from the units who were in, from that period, we've got some quotations, some um, sources pointing out to the conscious or rather unconscious racism that pervades uh, British Army establishment at that stage. For instance, on the 23rd of January 1917, the War Cabinet received a report from the War Office stating that the British West Indies Regiment had done well carrying ammunition along the lines of communication, but they had not received good reports as frontline soldiers which is rather not statements, taking into account that they had thus far never been used in that role. And CLR James, well-known Marxist historian, called it the old story of the black man being first refused an opportunity to be afterwards condemned for incapacity. And CLR James himself um, has a link with the British West, East, West Indies Regiment. He was one of the men um, offering himself for service in Trinidad and refused, this, despite the fact that he was a very uh, a sportsman, um, and he also wrote uh, the biography of Captain Cipriani, who was uh, um, an officer of one of the West Indian uh, battalions. So the official casualty figures. Um, official casualty figures by the West India Committee says that of the 15,000, only 185 are killed in action or died of wounds and uh, nearly 1,100 died from disease. Now, according to the Borges Commission, you've got 1,400 dead, of which 100 died in the West Indies, 124 are remembered in the UK, so the majority of them died on sea. Um, in Italy, mainly after the armistice, nearly 160, 220 only in the Middle East, 
and more than 700 on the Western Front, 522 in France and 181 in Flanders. And this somewhat, in my opinion, contradicts the high number of deaths from disease. Um, it indicates that there were more deaths of war conditions. Um, new research uh, performed by, by um, in, in the frame of the name list, which is a, an inclusive casualty list of those killed uh, in Belgium during the First World War. Um, and we found out that 232 British West Indies regiment fatalities fell in Belgium. What explains the difference with the official figures from the War Grace Commission is that 49 of them are commemorated in France. They died in Belgium, but they were buried or later concentrated just across uh, the border. Of them, only, or, only three are whites. Um, and that's another explanation because two of the officers are recorded by the War Grace Commission under their um, initial regiment before they were attached to the British West Indies regiment. 90% uh, are privates. Um, this is not a strict list. I know that there are mistakes and probably this will uh, be adjusted later on. All those who died in Flanders died between um, the end of May 1917 and the beginning of January 1918, meaning during the third battle of Ypres. There's no peak within these seven, eight months, um, but it coincides with the third battle of Ypres. Um, so, the number of West Indian dead as a result of shelling and air raids is much higher than generally believed in the past. Um, you would find groups, 33 graves on for those familiar with the, the area, Dozingham Cemetery, Mandingham Cemetery, Listentook Cemetery, um, and 25 other cemeteries in Ypres, around Ypres. Um, eight on the Menin Gate, eight names on the Menin Gate, of whom several at the Addenda, so who were added later on. Um, almost all colonies are represented. The only colony I couldn't find someone from yet is Belize. But quite often we do not know where the people were coming from. So what do they do? Um, loading, transporting and unloading ammunition, but also digging trenches and all kinds of construction works such as building artillery positions and sometimes very close to the front line. Um, but what we also see is companies being split up over a very wide area. Just to give you one example, one company of Fort Battalion um, in um, summer 1918 is working in an area of 100 square kilometers. So uh, one platoon is, is working 80, what is that in miles, 60 miles, 65 miles from, from the other. Really a very wide area. So you could actually see there you're being used as, as reservoirs of men, wherever people are needed, they are brought in. Um, sometimes very gruesome tasks. Etienne Dupuis for battalion once had to repair a section of a communication trench that had collapsed after a German barrage and the pigs were plowing uh, through the bodies of men who had been killed and were buried when the trench uh, fell in. There was a frustration because they were not allowed to fight. Um, you would see them on the photographs with their rifles um, and uh, we do have reports of, of generally very soldierly behaviour. Um, every battalion has its own band and very interesting for me as a Belgian, some, we know some of the names of the marches they composed. There was a march called Poppering and there was a march called Ondank, which is a very small hamlet, but the places where they were blitted. Um, about that frustration, um, Chaplain Horner, who was the padre of one, uh, I think, nine battalion, uh, wrote, when we hear that colored soldiers in the other armies have shown remarkable aptitude in the attack, we, who are in the know, feel certain that the same desire to be personal in at the thing animates our boys too. But so you had this constant confrontation with a certain degree of um, racism, um, even when the war ended, because um, the cartoon on the left was published in Punch in uh, 1919. Um, Etienne Dupuis, so one, the Bahamian who published his, uh, his memoirs, he served in C Company of the 4th Battalion, and he described his commanding officer, Captain George Dawson, as, and I quote him, the headman of a large cane plantation in Jamaica, where it was clear he was used to treating men like animals. Um, another person was Major Reginald Elgar Willis, who, by the way, was the son of a preacher. Uh, Willis joined in December 1916, was given the rank of lieutenant, but little over three months later, he was already appointed major and temporary colonel. And that's a very swift climb in the military hierarchy that might corroborate CLR James's statement about the inferior quality of many 
officers. And one of the stories told about that Willis was that he once had dug his spurs into the bandaged legs of a frostbitten man who had not sprung up to salute him. And when the suffering man painfully struggled up to his feet and hobbled away, uh, the colonel was heard saying to a sergeant, when you write your mutty on the mountain back in Jamaica, tell the folks I'm turning Jesus Christ out here. I'm making the lame walk. Um, in a private letter from Chaplain Harry Brown, 10th Battalion to the West Indian Contingent Committee in London, um, the minister complained that he had, and I quote him, discovered German prisoners, warm and comfortable, their rooms adequately heated by stoves, and in the same barracks, our West India boys on the extreme top floor without warming apparatus of any kind, cold and suffering. Um, another indi indication of that unconscious, of these unconscious racist attitudes if um, the higher, relatively higher figure of uh, death sentences, eight British West Indian regiment men sentenced to death, um, including 17-year-old um, Herbert Morris in September 1917, be it and that's always interesting to take into account on the worst possible moment, because just a couple of days previously, uh, there were riots with the Egyptian Labour Corps, with the Chinese Labour Corps, um, which might explain the very strict attitude um, taken during the courts martial. Now, what's always interesting is, and I mean, I'm here from Ypres, so is relating locations to particular stories. Now, this is a headstone on Gualia Cemetery. Um, that's the area around the brook you see over there where 3rd and 4th Battalion had their camps. And um, in the memoirs of uh, Etienne Dupuche, he describes uh, something that happened on the 29th of July 1917. And I write, I read from uh, the memoir. The men were on parade in Belgium one day, ready to march off on a day's detail when shells from Passchendaele Ridge started falling in the area. As shells started inching nearer and nearer, Sergeant Spalkman ran out to the parade ground and told the Jamaican corporal in charge of the squad to dismiss the parade and let the man take cover. If Jesus Christ came down here today and told me to dismiss the parade, the corporal declared, I wouldn't do it. The blasphemy was hardly out of his mouth when a shell fell right in the middle of the parade and man went down like ten pins in a bowling alley. When the smoke cleared, Sparkman lay on the ground his uniform spotless, but his head had been blown off from the shoulder by a piece of shrapnel. And I mean, if you have that story and you stand on the spot where uh, you could find, it also shows how um, Dupuis made a very good, he published his memoir in the 1980s. So either he had made notes or he had a very good memoir uh, because it's literally spot on. Um, meeting locals. Is, that's obviously something that always interests me. Um, and we do have reports of, of engagement with local people, apart from the odd photograph. Uh, Private Norris Reed Roach, who wrote in a letter published in the Grenadian newspaper, The West Indian, how the children are very nice. They come around and throw chocolates and cigarettes to the boys, for we are not allowed to go out from camp. These children tell us all the news. Now, now you might wonder, these children, France and Flanders, speaking English, well, they did, and if you allow me a very personal anecdote, when I was 15 years old and I had my first lessons of English in school, and at noon I went to eat with my, my granny. And my granny is born in Ypres and was raised during the First World War in Poppering. Now, she spoke very well English, but she couldn't read or write it. And this was the English she had picked up as a 7 to 11 year old in the cafe of her aunt in Poppering. So children do pick up a lot of, of and English is not that much diff, oh well, I mean Flemish is quite close to English, so uh, that might explain. Yeah, I think English is some later development of Flemish, actually. <laughs> yes, yes. These, the strangers, the strangers at Norwich brought it along and, and so on. Um, another statement, the APM of Poppering, 19th of July, 1917, states that the Estamina Bredel de Koning can be used for serving drinks to black troops, it being the only place where no female are employed, and thus exemplifying the established practice within the British Army of preventing non-white military personnel of engaging with white women. Um, a last quote by a Flam, uh, Fleming, Father von Wallagem, probably the most important diary of a local. Um, 
during the First World War, 1917, on the farm of, on the farm of Alois Adrian and the Drihoon, that's the name of the farm, blacks from the West Indies, Jamaica, have arrived to work. They are dressed like the English soldiers. They are civilized, speak very softly, but are not sought after. Um, the civilians usually prefer their heels to their toes because when they go in for a cup of coffee, they can sit there for several hours or just five minutes. And then he noted in the margin, I found a letter, well, he's a priest, so he's very curious, so he probably, I found a letter from one of those blacks written to him by his mother. How sincerely Christian, how motherly, not one of our mothers would speak better. So again, you see that amazement of, well, these are educated people and even the mother is able to write to her son. So um, there is some important importance in these acquaintances. Now, the armistice comes. And after the armistice, 8,000 men are concentrated uh, near Toronto in the heel of Italy. And uh, they are brought under the command of South African General Kerry Barnard. And Kerry Barnard stated that he had no intention of treating West Indians like British troops, that they were only niggers and better treated than any nigger had a right to expect. So you could see this is trouble in the coming. Um, and at the same period, uh, November, December 1918, there's a general pay rise in the British Army and the British West Indies Regiment is, ex is accepted. So there's an exception, they don't receive that pay rise. And you've got a twofold reaction. And that was actually, um, certainly after the 6th of December 1918, 6th of December 1918, some men were ordered to clean latrines of Italian workers. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And the result was three days of mutiny. And after this mutiny, you had a double reaction within the West Indian troops. Um, on the 17th of December 1918, and this is the illegal political action, you have the creation of a Caribbean League. The sergeants of the British West Indies Regiment gathering together and stating, and this is the statement as it was written down by uh, a spy basically, um, or the informer, the black man should have freedom and govern himself in the West Indies and that force must be used and if necessary bloodshed to attain that objective. This is quite important because what you see is that the initial hope of becoming citizens well, now has devolved in some kind of home rule, request from home rule. But at the same time, you also had formal protests. What you see here in the form of a petition by 180 sergeants against the discrimination in pay rise, and they obtained it. So the pay rise uh, was allowed. And also that poem, which dates from that period, which clearly shows the politicization of these soon-to-be veterans. So and then they return. They return home, um, and we're in the red summer of 1919. Many race riots in the US, race riots in the UK, Cardiff, Liverpool, some other places. Um, and the British West Indies Regiment is not allowed to join the victory parade, which is again considered a slur. Um, and what you see is when they returned home, there are riots in Jamaica between white and black. In Trinidad, during the victory march, the black veterans who are taking part are booing. In British Honduras, you have heavy riots and police even have to cooperate with the veterans to calm things down. On Barbados, there's a mutiny on the troop ship returning in September 1919. And sometimes ships were not allowed to embark until uh, proper British uh, army personnel had arrived to uh, keep an eye on them. And after the war, what you see is also to deal with the social problems and the problem of unemployment is um, that immigration to Cuba was encouraged. And half, half of Jamaican and Barbadian veterans accepted that offer. And until at least the 1990s, you had a British club in Guantanamo where some uh, veterans of the British West Indies regiments were a uh, member. I'm hurry. Um, but the West Indies remained very racist and unequal, uh, even in memorials. I mean, this is a photograph of Roll of Honor in Barbados, I believe. Um, and apart from maybe one, all the guys listed on it are white and served in uh, British units. Um, but yet the veterans of the British West Indies Regiment played a major role, and I'll just point out some personal trajectories of people who are very important in the West Indies. First one is not 
a member, was not a member of the British West Indies Regiment, but he's too important to leave him out, and that's Norman Manley, later to become Prime Minister of Jamaica. Uh, Manley was slightly coloured, one eight black, and in 1914 he was studying in Oxford with his brother Roy, uh, whom you see in the middle. And um, he was first refused because of his skin colour, and then he joined in working class Deptford in the Royal Fields Artillery, raised to the role of corporal, um, and asked to be reverted to the rank of private because of that racism. Um, 26th of July 1917 is Roy Kills near Poppering, mainly suffering shell shock. Later on, he would go into politics, People's National Party, um, getting self government in 1944. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, I corresponded with his, um, his granddaughter. For the remainder of his life, he would wear a black tie in uh, remembrance of his brother who's buried in Poppering. Um, William Wellington Woodward Grant, veteran without a job, he moves to New York, joins the UNI, um, so the United Negro Improvement Association, which was the most militant black nationalist organization. He always on parades, he was a soapbox orator, um, activist, always wore his medals um, because that gave him status. That's the reason why so many veterans would be compelled to go into politics. Captain Cipriani, um, who was a white man from Corsican descent, um, who was impressed by the abilities of the West Indians during the war, who founded first the Union, then a political party, and who would make it to mayor of Port of Spain, so the capital of Trinidad. Um, Sam Manning, other cultural figure, um, the world's most famous Calypso player, still nice films on YouTube because he featured in many films. Um, Samuel Haynes, um, who was involved in the riots in Belize, um, and he would go on to write uh, what is now the lyrics of the national hymn of uh, Belize, also active in that UNIA. Uriah Buzz Butler, who's very strange, um, served in, in Trinidad in politics, um, and had his own political line, which is described as a mixture of Bible and Marxism, whatever that might <laughs> mean. Um, but the name of his party was the British Empire Workers and Citizens Home Rule Party. So you see that still at that stage, and certainly the veterans had that attachment to British Empire and British loyalty. And then Etienne Dupuis, whose uh, memoirs I use, who was a newspaper editor, um, you will find him in the Guinness Book of Records because he was the longest serving newspaper editor ever. I will skip this. This is uh, small, but I can talk to you about that later on. That's a small. Um, I, I made a comparison with the French Caribbean, uh, where basically you see a different reaction. Uh, French Caribbean in, in 1919, France considered selling their islands to the Americans, as Denmark had just done previously, and the reaction from the veterans was furious. Um, but they very big difference. They already had a, a, a black representative in French Parliament. And so what you see in, in, in uh, the French Caribbean is, is a, I mean, they wanted to become proper French département rather than home rule. So uh, quite a, another re evolution. So, no panic, final slide. <laughs> how are they remembered? As I said, very little research. Um, how, and it's, it's quite strange because generally the First World War is recognized. If you look into general histories of the Caribbean, um, the First World War is always recognized as a watershed in political and social history of the area. But the military component is seldom taken into account, which is a very odd thing. So historians are aware of it is an important watershed, but it has not been properly investigated. Um, you've got the war memorials to the left. I believe that's in Port of Spain. Um, bottom right, uh, Jamaica, Kingston. Uh, Armistice Day is observed with the last post and everything as you would expect. Um, and there's the important role of the Caribbean diaspora. And very glad to have some people from the National Caribbean Monument Charity here who are uh, working towards a more proper commemoration of these men who served in the First World War. And what you see here is... Uh, a small get-together remembrance we've done a couple of times. Um, the Friends of Inflanders Fields Museum, together with people from the National Caribbean Monument Charity uh, on uh, the cemetery in Poppering, where Roy Manley 
and um, Herbert Morris or Burrit. So, to conclude, the Western Front is an integral part of the history of the Caribbean, and the presence of Caribbean soldiers is an integral part of the history of the Western Front. And this is shared history, a shared history commemorating together British, Belgian, French and Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean means meeting, means getting to know each other and also means working towards a better common future, in my opinion. And for me, that's also what history is about. And I hope you all buy my book in October. <laughs>